we have learned so far is that by virtue of the coast theorem, we can actually find a private solution that is Pareto efficient, a private solution in a missing market. We had the example of the market for smoking or the market for clean air that doesn't really exist, but we can find a solution, a bargaining solution that is as good as it would be if that market existed. And we have seen that this crucially depends on negotiations being feasible between two or more parties, and also, and especially so, that property rights are well defined. Um, but we should also then talk about some of the limitations of the Coase theorem. So the Coase theorem may apply in reality when there is few parties involved that, and when the property rights are well defined. And few parties typically means that the transaction costs and the bargaining costs are very low. But as soon as there are more parties involved, and or property rights are not so well defined, we have problems. So, um, you know, when, when you have negative externalities, when you don't have clear property rights, there's just the risk of overuse of a common resource, which is called tragedy of the common. Um, if you have the lack of clear property rights, you cannot come to a bargaining solution, so you have uh, over, you know, overuse of re resources such as as uh, forests in the you know, Brazil and, and other parts of the world. Uh, you have things like road congestion. Uh, you have overfishing, over pollution, over, over, over. And that that and one reason why this is the case is uh, because there is a lack of clear property rights. And related to that is a second problem, namely the problem, um, the assignment problem, we, for which the guiding question is, well, who is actually to blame for the externality to begin with? Um, this is easy when you have one smoker and one non-smoker. It's very clear who, who causes the externality. And then once we know the property rights, we can work out what the Pareto efficient solution might be. But in a world where, you know, think about global warming, that is truly a global problem and a global challenge. Um, there are obviously many people who contribute to, to that problem and who contribute to that externality. And so assigning, you know, even if we knew the property rights, you know, do people have the right to clean air or to, to know global warming? It's very, very hard to then pinpoint the people who, who caused that externality and, and, and really, um, you know, bargain with them, right? It's, it's almost impossible. Another problem that even can uh, arise when you have smaller numbers of, uh, of people or firms, parties involved in, uh, in the, the negotiation is the so-called holdout problem. So if you think about a situation where the property rights are not held by one person or one party, but by a couple of people, um, and depending on obviously how those, those uh, within that group of the people who own the property rights, how they're organized, um, that depends very much on how the negotiations go. If they, for example, decide by a uh, uniformity rule, or you, if, if they have to decide unanimously, what that means is that each member of that group can exert its veto power and can extract rents from that. Because if you think about a, you know, that, that a game where, where the negotiation happens sequentially, so the person first negotiates with the, the, the first member of the group, then the second member, then the third, if the first two say, okay, deal, if I'm the third and last, then I can extract a very high rent because I have the power to break down the whole negotiation. So I, I, I can say, okay, I want a lot more um, 
from the opposite party. Otherwise, I'll, I'll simply make the negotiations break down. Um, you see this very often in, in political negotiations, especially in the EU, where you have a unanimity rule. But in essence, you have this, um, you, you have this in, in many economic situations, the, the holdout problem, which is the, the, that if you have veto power, you can extract rents and that can lead to a breakdown of the negotiation. Then you obviously also have a free rider problem here uh, when it comes to externalities. When a lot of people or firms have to pay for the compensation, right? Then, then you have the, the compensation can almost, you know, almost works like a public good and, and every individual member has the incentive to free ride and has to the incentive to pay less than what is socially optimal. That again creates, uh, creates problems because we have then an undercompensation and basically also a breakdown of the negotiation in the most extreme. And the last problem here is transaction cost. So as you may imagine, negotiations are generally very, very difficult to do. Um, yeah, even between two people, they're difficult, but then let alone with many people. Um, you know, think about the, uh, the, all the climate change agreements, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, uh, where you have to get so many parties together at the negotiating table. Um, just simply organizing that is, is a long process that, you know, takes a lot of time and resources and is not something that is to be done um, easily. And even if you have small groups, sometimes there may just be cultural norms that create transaction costs, right? So if you have a neighbor that, that you know, makes a lot of noise, um, you know, can, I, can you ask them to reduce the noise? Well, it depends on in what country you live and what neighborhood and who your neighbor is and so on. But th th this is also just an example of a transaction. So to sum this up, there are lots of reasons why the code theorem may break down in reality. Nonetheless, it is important to emphasize that there can be a bargaining solution to be had in the market, um, and that that is obviously a very, very important insight. And for everything else, we need to find different solutions, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next videos.